Hello and welcome. I'm Travis Brungard. Uh, I'm in Prairie Village, Kansas, and I would like to welcome you all to the BS and Beer Show. Uh, of course, the BS stands for Building Science. Tonight's topic is hot water distribution systems. You'll notice I did not say hot water heaters and how they distribute hot water because no one would say that. And if they do, the drinking game begins. You drink if you say hot water heater. It's going to be a rough night for some of you. Uh, not for any of our panel, of course. Well, maybe Ben. Anyway, uh, as I said, I'm Travis Brungard. I'm in Prairie Village, Kansas. I'm drinking a Schnickel Fritz, uh, which is my go-to from Urban Chestnut. It's fantastic. Uh, the BS and Beer Show is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our Zoom show. Uh, the brew crew and our guests volunteer our time each week to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building, our media partners. And with that, I would like to introduce Emily. Hi, guys. Emily Mottram here in Maine. Uh, it's dry January, so it was a pretty lush December. And uh, if we're able to meet at IBS, we'll be drinking at IBS. So that might take a break for January. So just some, some good old-fashioned filtered water tonight. And it's cold. <laughs> so uh, you can find the chat box off cut, uh, icon on the bottom of the screen. It's probably flashing. Um, lots of people talking. Go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us you're here and what you're drinking if you want um, so that all of your friends know that you're here. Otherwise, only the panelists can see you. On top of that, please pick everyone or all hosts and all attendees, um, depending on which version of Zoom you have, so that everybody uh, in the audience can see your comments and questions uh, during the chat. Otherwise, only the panelists will do it. And you may have to check every time because it does auto default back to just the panelists for some who knows what reason. Fine Home Building uh, sends out a Zoom reminder each week. The Zoom reminder is just that we're having a show. If you want to know what the show is going to be, what the topic is, and who's coming on to guest with us, uh, jump over to bsandbeershow.com and join our mailing list. Um, video recording of tonight's show will be up on both Green Building Advisor and on our YouTube channel, The BS and Beer Show. You can watch all of our past or previous shows as well. So if you missed anything that we went over, pop over there and take a look at the show recordings. You can also find an audio only version of the BS and beer show on Spotify and Apple podcasts. So a couple of mentions, um, NAHB's International Builder Show is going to be February 8th through 10th, and all things uh, ago, we will be there doing live BS and beer shows uh, at the event. Um, Mike's going to put links in the chat box. Efficiency Vermont's Better Buildings Conference is February 2nd uh, and 3rd in Burlington, Vermont, and Nessie's Building Energy Boston Conference is February 28th through March 1st in Boston. And we also want to mention that Passive House Network's Introduction to Passive House Trades Course, a four-hour on-demand format training course for contractors and tradespeople working on passive house and residential commercial building construction. The course is now live and accessible at any time, uh, so there'll be a link to that as well. So off to you, Ben, to introduce our esteemed guest. Thank you, Emily. I'm Ben Bogey, uh, phoning in from Connecticut. And this evening, I'm drinking one of my favorite main brews. It's called Thirsty Botanist from Booth Bay Craft Brewery, delicious IPA. Um, this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Scrimshaw Hatcheck, otherwise known as Allison Bales. Uh, Allison is the founder and owner of Energy Vanguard based in Decatur, Georgia. They offer building science training and HVAC, HVAC design consultation. He's also a longtime author at GBA, where he shares posts from his hugely popular Energy Vanguard blog, which covers everything from building science fundamentals to HVAC particulars to big picture topics like energy security and peak oil. If you're not subscribed to his blog, you're missing out. Allison, how are you this evening, sir? Doing well, doing well. How are you, Ben? Good. Anything we missed in there that you'd like to mention? Um, I'm writing a book, and I will mention that at the end of the, the session tonight as well. Eagerly awaited. All right. So am I taking off now? Is that what it is? It's your okay. stage, sir. So um, I am drinking water tonight out of my Energy Vanguard mug. And some of you may know what is on the other side of the mug because I posted it on LinkedIn. I'll show you. It says, don't get cocky. <laughs> I had these made um, last month. I gave, gave them to everybody at Energy Vanguard. 
Okay, so let me share my screen, see if I can get this to work okay. I'm not allowed to share my screen, uh-oh. Will somebody please let me share my screen? Should be good, Emily's on it. You're good Ben's to go, sorry, it. I have myself muted. Uh, Charlie forgot, you should be good to go now. Okay. All right, um, let's see, desktop two. Desktop two, share. Okay, um, and then we start the slideshow. Presenter view. Okay, are you guys seeing the right thing there? You see just the title slide? Okay. No, we can see your, or I can at least see your whole slideshow. I see London, I see France, I see the whole slideshow. Okay, all right. So let me, uh, I'm sharing the wrong screen then. So let's do share screen again. Desktop two, I must have done this. And while, while you load that up, Allison, we'll, Ben and I will start with some show tunes. Oh, darn. Okay, I guess we'll do Alice's thing. <laughs> okay, all right. Now do you see the right thing? The audience missed out there. <laughs> okay, just the, the title slide there. Okay, so, and this is um, uh, understanding the residential water heating system. Uh, um, as Travis said, it's not just about water heaters, and I'm also not talking about just the distribution system either. And we will talk a lot about the distribution system, but um, I'm going to start with... Water heating is a system. Uh, you, you know, we're used to this expression, a house is a system, right? But water heating also is a subsystem within a house. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of people just think of the water heater, but the water heating is a whole system and it um, has inputs. For example, you know, this electric water heater has two inputs. It's got water and it's got electricity, the energy input that makes the water hot. Um, this is how we do electric water heaters in the south. Just put them out in the backyard. Um, if you want to see a, a better installation, here's here's what our electric water heaters usually look like. That one I just showed was um, near where I used to live a long time ago, and I stopped and took a bunch of pictures of it. It was amazing. So um, electric water heaters, you get two inputs. You get the water, you get the energy coming in through that uh, wire inside the conduit going into the top of the water heater. Um, gas water heaters have another, a different kind of energy input. It's gas coming in through the gas line there and also water. And we have a tankless gas water heater, which has the water input, it has energy input. But it also has a different kind of energy input. Tankless water heaters, tankless gas water heaters, have uh, use both electricity and gas, which means that when the electricity goes out, you don't have hot water. And unlike with a uh, storage water heater, you don't even have the water saved in the tank because there's no tank. And then we have heat pump water heaters. Let me move this out of my way. Okay. That's better. With heat pump water heaters, we have um, energy coming in through that uh, conduit with the electric line in there and the water. And uh, now I've got to click over here again. And we also have air because heat pump water heaters take heat out of the air to put it into the water. Um, solar water heaters take solar energy and put it in. We also have the water input, of course, and there's going to be electricity or some some supplemental source for the backup heat because solar water heaters don't provide 100% of your water, your hot water. Outputs, hot water, obviously, right? But if you're using combustion, you also have exhaust gases coming out. And if you're using a heat pump water heater, you have cool air coming out, which is a nice thing in summertime in a hot place, but um, not so nice in Maine in the wintertime, maybe. But you can account for that. And, and um, it's a, a matter of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're using space heat from the house. So the space heating system is, is also providing your water heating. So it's kind of a separated combi system in a way. <laughs> then we've got the distribution system. Um, usually a trunk and branch system, um, sometimes zoned, sometimes not. You've got copper pipes going through. You've got branches coming off of those. Sometimes you have twigs coming off of the branches, as Gary Klein likes to call them. 
Sometimes you have a home run system with the uh, with manifolds and the hot and cold water lines coming off each manifold and going out to the fixtures. Sometimes you have recirculating pumps on the distribution side, and there's two kinds we'll talk about. And since we're getting these pipes hot, we want to save heat as much as possible. So insulation is a good thing. And um, many older systems are not insulated. It's required in code now, finally. So it's a good idea to have your pipes insulated. Uh, there's another way to save heat. And um, it makes sense in, in some situations. You wrap some copper tube around your drain uh, for a shower and you um, recover the heat from the hot water going down the drain. Um, and that uh, pre-warmed water goes back into your cold water line. Some of it can go directly back to the shower while you're showering. Some of it goes back to the water heater. And then there's some other stuff. Um, some of you may know what this is. This is something that I recently had to put on my house because I was uh, hearing this banging in the mornings. Our laundry room is, is um, on one side of the water supply or one side of the house. And my desk is between the laundry room and where the water comes in. And um, so when we uh, would do laundry, I would hear this banging going on called water hammer. So I bought these water hammer arresters, put them on the uh, on the water lines for the washing machine. No more water hammer. I hear a little bit with the dishwasher sometimes, but I'll deal with that later. That's not nearly as bad though. And then we have, um, oh, and let me talk about this a little bit more. So water hammer is um, because you, you get a pressure wave. When, when you have a valve that, that shuts off quickly, like in a washing machine or a dishwasher is usually where this happens, the, you get, uh, you know, the, the water's coming in at a certain flow rate and, and boom, it stops. And that puts a, a pressure wave that goes back through the line. And that's the banging that you hear. So that's the water hammers, so that pressure wave traveling back through the line. Another important property of water to take uh, note of is that it is um, it expands when it heats up. So when you have a water heater heating up cold water, and when you have a cold water heater heating up the water, that water expands. And it used to be that there wasn't a check valve stopping that water from going back into the supply line at the street, but now those check valves exist. So it cannot expand back to the water supply. Um, so we put these expansion tanks, these, these little uh, two or three gallon expansion tanks there to um, deal with that expansion that happens as the water heats up. And then um, at the end of the system, we have the different fixtures and the controls. This is an old school faucet with um, separate cold and hot valves, which seems quaint now, but uh, there is an advantage to that. Uh, with the new style where you have a single valve that mixes hot and cold together. Um, it's often not obvious from just looking at that, which way is hot and which way is cold. So um, a lot of times you, you may turn on the valve and you may unintentionally be calling for hot water even though you don't mean to, because if the valve is like that, so this uh, and this particular valve straight up means cold. Um, and 90 degrees down means hot, and this means somewhere between hot and cold. So if, if you turn it on like this every single time, you are shooting a little bit of hot water into the line. And in my case, this is my kitchen, um, that hot water is never going to get there. If I'm just washing my hands or rinsing something off, that hot water is never going to get there. So I'm just wasting hot water when I do that. So it's better if you're just looking for cold water, make sure that you have the valve in that position. And we have these end uses, we have showers and we have um, dishwashers and washing machines and all these other things. And um, so that's the, the whole hot water system. Oh, and also this giant uh, whirlpool tub right behind me. Let's take a quick look at water heaters. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, just briefly describe some of the main types, gas, natural draft water heater. This is what I see in many, many, many houses. This picture here, for example, is a million dollar house in Atlanta. Um, and they had, I think, three of these. <laughs> three of these natural draft gas water heaters in a mechanical room in the finished basement. Um, so unfortunately, that's what people use. The, you know, the good thing is the power goes out, 
this will still work because it's got a pilot light and uh, it does not use electricity. Now the recirculating pump does use electricity, so you won't get the hot water as fast. And then another type of gas water heater is the direct vent where you both bring in the combustion air and exhaust the exhaust gases through the same pipe. It's concentric pipes actually. And so you're not depressurizing the area around it. It goes up and, and has to go out through the sidewall. You can't put a whole lot of pipe on that. Um, these things are safer because they're, it's almost, I mean, you can't really backdraft these in the house. Then you've got power vented water heaters. And now we've got two types of energy again. Uh, so when the electricity goes out, your water heater is not going to work. But you do have a tank full of hot water. So you can use that for a little while. Tankless water heater we just talked about a minute ago, um, gas and electricity. And there's two kinds of tankless water heaters. The um, uh, it depends on the kind of combustion and whether you have the secondary heat exchanger or not. Because as you know, with um, the standard gas water heater, like the first one I showed, the natural draft gas water heater, if you put your hand on that flue when it's firing, it's gonna be very hot and you're gonna burn your hand. So um, there's a lot of heat going up in the exhaust gases. You can capture that heat by condensing the water vapor in the exhaust gases with the secondary heat exchanger, and that's called a condensing uh, water heater. And you can do that with storage or tankless, but in tankless, you can either get the condensing tankless water heaters or the non-condensing tankless water heaters. The non-condensing are about 80 to 85% efficient. The condensing water heaters are about 95% efficient. So, um, that's that. And then we've got electric resistance water heaters, which can be a perfectly good option in some cases. We you know there's a lot of a big move towards electrification because electricity is getting cleaner. And depending on where you live, it may already be really, really clean. And if you're putting, uh, if you've got PV on your roof or in your yard, um, electric resistance water heater may be a, a, a excellent option for you. Another way to use electricity is with the heat pump water heater, which um, this one um, is a steeple Eltron, pulls in air through the, the grate and blows it out the grate on uh, the grill on the other side. This is the one in my house. And uh, a few months ago, I wrote a, a thorough article about my first two years with this water heater. So you can check out the blog. It's called Living with a Heat Pump Water Heater. Um, it, this is the output um, side for the air. And notice it's nice and round. I can attach a duct to that. I haven't done it yet. Um, the input or the intake is up on top of the water heater and it's also um, available for attaching a duct to. So you can duct the air from different places for this type of water heater, which can be a good thing. Here's basically how they work. It pulls um, air in, for, uh, in this case, with the grill on it from the space around it. Um, and it goes through the, the little heat pump sitting on top of the tank. The heat pump puts the refrigerant through the cycle, the thermodynamic cycle, and extracts heat from the air that's going through, blows cool air out the other side, and takes that heat through a heat exchanger wrapped around the tank and puts heat into the water. Yay, we get hot water from the air and electricity. This is um, my last year's uh, energy use in my water heater. And you can see the very important trend here. Notice that in January, all the way on the left, was the highest month of the year. And then went down, 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 down. And June, July, and August were the three lowest months. September spiked up for a reason um, that was not an anomaly. I mean, it is an anomaly, but it's an, a known anomaly. The reason that happened is that I drained the water heater tank in September and had to refill it. And when I refilled it, it had to heat a whole new bunch of, of water. So that's why September was so high. Um, so I used, as you can see at the top, 527 kilowatt hours of electricity for my heat pump water heater last year. It's got a UEF, a uniform energy factor of 3.7, which is really high. So it's like 370% efficient. Woo! That's a lot. 
2020, my first full year of using the water heater, I used 486. So I'm averaging about 500 kilowatt hours a year. And um, so that's the September jump. And I calculated, you can read the article, the details about this, but I calculated about a three and a half year simple payback for this water heater. And, and this is based on replacing um, a gas water heater with my heat pump water heater. And the, the reason it came out to three and a half years is because we have um, what my friend Mike Barsett calls the welcome to gas fee in Georgia after deregulation. And it costs about 35 to $38 a month, whether you use any gas or not, you got to pay that 35 to $38. So that makes my payback look a lot better. Um, because that's the only like only gas I was using at the time. So hot water distribution system. Let's get into that. I also wrote about this. This is my kitchen sink. And that's a that's my bucket, and that's water filling the bucket. It took two and a half minutes um, and three gallons to get hot water to get to my kitchen sink. And I've I've made this measurement a bunch of times now, so it's it's pretty consistent. <laughs> two and a half um, minutes and three gallons. That is a long wait for hot water. Uh, that's way too long. And I'm gonna be gutting my basement and, and redoing everything completely and, uh, and making that much, much better. Um, but uh, so this is, I mean, this, I mean, mine is probably longer than, I'm sure it's longer than the average. I hope it's longer than the average, um, but you know, it's not unusual. My friend, David Wasserman, who lives a few miles from me, he's an engineer and he's showing me his retrofit here, but um, he also, I mean, before he did this retrofit, it took more than a minute to, for him to get hot water at his kitchen sink. And his kitchen sink is a lot closer to his water heater than mine is. So, it's a problem. Um, why does this happen? Why um, are we uh, you know, having to spend so much time waiting? I got it. How do I move that? Oh, there we go. Let's try to do something over here. There we go. Now back up here. So the um, one of the reasons, there's two, two main reasons, and, and one of them is that the pipes are too long. Um, we, we don't have houses optimized to minimize the length of hot water pipes. And the longer the hot water pipes are, the um, more water is in there that may be cold when you, when you call for hot water. So um, one of the reasons the pipes are too long is because people put the water heaters in stupid places. <laughs> this is that same house. Um, that was a really stupid one. But here's, uh, here's something really interesting. Gary Klein um, and his hot water colleagues in California came up with something really useful for helping under, you know, understand how efficient uh, a house is and its hot water layout and the, hot, and the hot water distribution system. They call this the hot water system rectangle or the hot water rectangle. And here's an example of a single story house where the, um, uh, the, uh, the red rectangle there is the, the smallest rectangle that I could draw that includes all of the hot water fixtures and the water heater. So that's the hot water system rectangle. And the, um, this is a single story house uh, that's all conditioned floor area uh, and inside the, the black rectangle. And so the, the hot water rectangle is a little bit smaller than the black rectangle. So our hot water rectangle ratio is 93% in this case. Now it could be more than 100% because uh, let's say, you know, on the top left side of the house where the laundry and the, and the water heater are, I mean, if that were an attached garage, then the laundry and the water heater uh, are in that area. And, and so that whole area uh, over there would be garage that wouldn't count as our square footage for the conditioned floor area. So the the uh, the black rectangle uh, it wouldn't be just the black rectangle. We'd sub subtract out that left uh, part of it for the garage, and so we would have more than a hundred percent of the hot water. The hot water rectangle ratio would be more than a hundred percent in that case. So 
you can do some, uh, I mean, with new construction, um, or if you're doing a big remodel, you can, you can change things around. And this is with a relatively minor change of the layout. So by, by moving the, um, the bathroom over here to this area and moving the primary bathroom over to that area, and then leaving the kitchen where it is, and just moving the, the um, sink and the dishwasher to the other side, we can reduce the size of that hot water rectangle, and now we're down to 26%. That's with the same basic layout, just moving the bathrooms and changing the, the arrangement of the kitchen. But you can do way more than that too. You can also move everything. And in this case, where we got them clustered in that uh, small square there, we're down to 3%. And you can still do even better than that. Gary Klein has a, um, uh, a builder that he's worked with in California who got down to less than 1%. They had the bathrooms backed up to the same wall. They had a kitchen on one side, the laundry on the other side, that, and, and the water heater was above one of the bathrooms, and the manifold was above the other bathroom. So they got down to less than 1% on their hot water rectangle ratio. Wow, amazing. This is a, a really nice tool. And, and at the end, I've got a list of resources for you. So you can look up the paper that, where they talk about this. And also just go to Gary Klein's website and then he's got all kinds of stuff on there. The second reason that it takes so long to get hot water at fixtures is pipes are too big. The, the diameter of the pipes is too big. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that flow rates have changed over the years. Um, 1992 was a big year for that because the Energy Policy Act uh, passed and was signed and became law. That required low flow fixtures. And so the, the maximum you're allowed to put in for a bathroom now is 2.2 gallons per minute. For a kitchen faucet is 2.2, shower head 2.5, um, dishwasher, washing machine. And before, you know, it was like three and a half or more gallons per minute for a bathroom and that went to 2.2. And you can get even lower flow fixtures. So same thing with the other um, end uses here. They all went down. And so we don't need water to come as quickly. That, and what that means is the flow rates are lower and the pipes are too big. So it takes longer to get there. Here is um, the pipes going to my kitchen. On the left, three quarter inch copper pipe that's the hot water line. On the right is a half inch cold water line going to the kitchen. And um, three quarter inch is a lot for just a kitchen faucet and a dishwasher. Um, that's, that's way bigger than it needs to be. So let, let's look at some details here. So we've got a three quarter inch diameter pipe. The uh, volume in there uh, is about two and a half gallons for every hundred feet of pipe. And that means that if I am uh, running three gallons into that bucket waiting for the hot water to arrive, that would mean that would be about 120 feet of pipe, right? So, but it's not that. It's not 120 feet because this guy, Gary Klein, um, knows a little bit about the flow. And actually, it, it, would, be, it would be 120 feet if um, when the, you know, if you got the, the cold water, the, I mean, the, the, the hot water pipe's been sitting there unused for a long time. The water's gotten cold. And now you turn on the, the, the tap and the, the water heater starts pushing the, the water through. And if, if that hot water coming in just pushed the water in front of it all the way, if we had displacement flow, then the 120 feet is what would happen. Um, but what happens is that the, the hot water coming in and meeting with that cold water, actually there's mixing going on. And so the amount of water you get out is about twice the amount of water that's sitting in the pipe between the water heater and the fixture that you just turned on. Does that make sense? You got about twice the amount of water in the pipe. Uh, uh, let's see, you, you get about twice as much uh, water out of the, uh, as what's in the pipe before you get the hot water. Um, so uh, let me make it real. So I get three gallons in my bucket while I'm waiting for hot water. 
what Gary is saying here is that only a, um, a gallon and a half is actually in the pipe. Another gallon and a half from the water heater mixes with that and isn't completely hot when it gets there. So it takes three gallons of water moving through the pipe before I get water that's hot enough. Um, if that doesn't make sense, so you think about it for a while and, and, and it will. Um, so we got to push about twice as much water through the pipe as is in the pipe to get the hot water. And so in my case, uh, that would mean a gallon and a half is in the pipe and that would correspond to about 60 feet of pipe. Now, my rough estimate is different than that. I, I estimated about 40 feet of pipe from my water heater to my kitchen, but that's only about a 50% error. And, and this was a pretty rough calculation and, and I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, when we start talking in orders of magnitude, factors of 10, then, uh, then I'd be worried, but the 50% error is pretty good for this calculation. So, <clears throat> Let's look at it this way. So um, my kitchen faucet, three gallons in two and a half minutes is 1.2 gallons per minute. If I wanted to cut that wait time down to six seconds, a tenth of a minute, um, I would need the, the, uh, the amount of water I'd need to push out is 0.12, but according to Gary Klein, that would mean 0.06 would actually be in the pipe. That's that factor of two that we talked about. And three eighths inch PEX. So if I replace my three quarter inch uh, copper with three eighths inch PEX, um, which holds half a gallon for each hundred feet, I would need a, um, I, I, to get it in six seconds, I would have to have no more than 12 feet of pipe but I've got about a 40 foot distance. Well, actually it's 40 feet the way it goes right now, but it goes a long way. Um, but the, the straight distance from the water heater to the kitchen is more than 12 feet. So um, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I'd either have to use a bigger pipe than three eighths inch or wait longer than six seconds. Now, six seconds is pretty fast. I, I, six seconds is ideal. And, um, but I mean, if I had to, uh, you know, my pipe is about, you know, let's say 30 feet. So um, if, if I had to wait three times that, if I had to wait 18 seconds, wow, 18 seconds, that's amazing. I have to wait two and a half minutes now. That would just be, that would, whew, that would be like heaven. Um, so here's what my friend David Wasserman did. He, um, he has, uh, kitchen, uh, hot water took about a minute to get there. And this was the, the original hot water line. And so he cut the, the hot water line here. He put a manifold on that he made out of, out of um, sections of, of copper pipe and copper tees. And then he put fittings on there and, and went to PEX. So he's got these shark bite fittings and PEX pipe in them. And he used quarter inch pipe uh, in here. Uh, so he, he, and he did this for three runs. One of them is the kitchen. I don't know which one of these is the kitchen, but here's, um, here's what it looks like uh, near, I think this is, no, this is going to one of the bathrooms. Uh, so here's the, the original water line, half inch in his case. So he cut it right here and he put a valve in. And you can see it's closed because he's not using that section. And he cut it right here. He put a T in where he attached the pecs, the quarter inch pecs coming in. And so his, um, his water is basically the same length. He didn't save much on the length, but he cut the diameter of the pipes down a whole lot. So he went from over a minute um, wait time in the kitchen to about seven or eight seconds. And, and I, I visited that. Uh, visited him there and timed it, and it was about seven or eight seconds. So that, that's amazing. Um, there are some issues with this, so you really need to be careful if you're if you're going to do this. Um, David is an engineer and knows what he's doing, but th there's pressure drops and velocities you need to worry about. And I'll give you a link for some uh, a calculator that you can play around with for that too. Hot water recirculating system. So there's the bad kind, the continuous hot water recirculation systems, which can uh, cost you a whole lot of money 
every month. You can put them on a timer. They're not quite as expensive, but they're still not, um, not great. Uh, the better way to do this is with a demand recirculation system where you put a, um, a pump at uh, the farthest fixture uh, or you know when a fixture that's far away anyway. And you can push a button or you can have it motion activated so that the, um, it'll re, uh, circulate the water. It'll bring the hot water to the fixture and push it back into the cold water pipe. Or you can put in a, a return line if you want. And, um, and then you know, after whatever amount of time it takes to do that, then you turn on the hot water and the, and the hot water's there. But it only comes when you push the button or, or the motion sensor catches it. Um, also on the distribution side, there's uh, different ways to set things up. You can, um, uh, oh, we're not talking about that yet. So this is, uh, let's talk about manifolds. So this is a home run system. And this is, this is nice uh, in a couple of ways. Um, so red is hot, blue is cold on the, on the hot side. We have the, the manifold here, this copper manifold and the individual runs, the home runs are coming out and notice they make these nice big sweeping turns, which is good. Um, it's like duck systems. You don't, want, you don't want sharp turns and things that are gonna drop the pressure a lot. So nice sweeping turn is good. Another good thing is uh, where all these are bunched up. If, if one or two of these calls for hot water, um, it can transfer heat to the other line. So it, it can help some depending on, on how the hot water is used in the house. What's not good about this is these are not insulated. They should be insulated. I took this picture a long time ago though before code required it. Now this is a, a different manifold system. And this is, this is an example of how not to do it. These fittings right here, these 90 degree fittings are terrible. They go inside the pipe which means you're reducing the diameter there. So not only do you have the 90 degree turn, but you reduce the diameter, which adds even more pressure drop right there. So much better is just to have continuous pipe and, and make a nice sweeping turn. These are the two guys that I've talked to the most about hot water and, and I am not an expert on this. Uh, I have written a chapter on it in my book. So I've, I've learned a whole lot about it. And I've written a bunch of articles in the past few months about this. But these guys know more than just about anybody I know. And um, they're both in California and done a lot of great work. So um, getting closer to the end here. In one of the articles I showed, I don't think it was this picture. I think it was from the app. Um, my Ream water heater has an app and it shows what the temperature is. And in my GBA article on the heat pump water heater, um, somebody commented and, and said, please turn up your, your temperature because you're gonna, you're gonna give yourself Legionnaire's disease by running it at only 120 degrees. And um, you know, I, I've looked into that and I, I've known about Legionnaire's. I mean, anybody in building science should know about Legionnaire's disease. It, it's, it's, not good, but there's some, some basic facts about it that, um, that I have learned. And I, I've, I've been asking around more because you know, I, I was wondering, you know, is this really something that, that I should be concerned about at home? I mean, how often does this happen? Well, so first let's talk about Legionella. Legionella pneumophila is a particular bacterium. And this picture is really cool. I got it from Wikipedia. This is uh, uh, Legionella bacteria being um, snagged by an amoeba. So you get this in your water system, you could get both Legionnaire's disease and amoebic dysentery at the same time. Wow. <laughs> Wouldn't that be not so fun? Um, so uh, Legionnaire's disease is a, a lung infection that you get by breathing in this bacteria, uh, these bacteria. And it, you know, if you get enough of it in your lungs, it can cause the infection and, and it can kill you. And as it did to a bunch of legionnaires back in the seventies when this was first discovered. Um, this, the bacteria uh, are in the soil, they're in natural waters, they, they like warm water and um, they become a problem in buildings. 
often it, it's uh, related to cooling towers, which is, you know, water is trickling down and some, you know, some of it gets aerosolized. And that's, that's where it becomes a problem. Um, and you also get biofilms building up in the stuff. And the, when the biofilms break up and get aerosolized, then you can breathe them in. It's when you breathe them in that, that you get the, the problem. And if you breathe enough of it in. So this is, um, um, it's an issue, but overall, the, the number of cases of Legionnaire's disease is pretty small. I'm not saying you shouldn't worry about it, but it, it's overall a pretty small number. Chlorine in the water system kills Legionella. Um, high, high temperatures do kill it, but it doesn't mean that it's killed throughout your whole water, uh, hot water system. For example, in the shower head, uh, I don't know many people who take a shower at 140 degrees. Uh, I know my, I don't take a shower at, with 140 degree water. And, I, and even if I set my water heater to 140 degrees, um, and, I, and if I could get 140 degree water in the shower, I would not take a shower at 140 degrees because it would be scalding. So in the shower head, you've got warm water, and that would be a place where Legionella could grow. Uh, and uh, keeping the water temperature high at the water heater is not going to solve that problem. So there's a, a paper I ran across just recently. Uh, Lou Harriman uh, has sent me a bunch of stuff. I asked, I asked him about this recently. So one of the papers he sent me had these five recommendations. These are you know, quoted word for word from this paper, which you'll see the name of in a minute. Uh, Number one, it says replace your shower head with one that makes um, bigger droplets, not, uh, not a fine mist. Number two, put a filter on it that filters out the, the, the uh, pieces of biofilm that break off and might get aerosolized. Number three, well, number three and number four are both the same thing. Ventilate, open a window, put in a better fan. And number five is reduce the amount of time that you're exposed to potential aerosolized Legionella. And the name of that paper is Management of Legionella and Water Systems. The, what I've discovered is that it's, um, it's usually, Legionnaire's disease usually occurs when there's some kind of a problem in the water system, like you know, a hot tub that isn't maintained, for example, in a home, um, or uh, maybe shower heads that have Got built up biofilms over years. So maybe just um, re you know, regularly clean out the shower head, get a new shower head, I don't know. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I want to end on. So here's my contact info. <clears throat> um, I also have a page on the website for the book. You can go to energyvanguard.com slash book to get to the page. And behind this blurry image is the book cover. And I'm going to send out an update to all the subscribers next week. So you'll get to see what the actual cover is going to look like. And here are those resources that I mentioned, the five resources. That The first one, Efficient Hot Water Piping by Gary Klein and, the, and JLC, is a really, really good article. If you want to understand the, you know, the issue of pipes that are too big and too long, read that article. It's a really well-written, easy-to-understand article. The website I told you that has the calculator is this one, plasticpipecalculator.com. So you can use that to see what kind of pressure drop you're getting. And if you can have enough pressure at the shower head, if you go to three eighths inch pipe from whatever you're at now and things like that. This third one is a report that they, they just came out with Gary Klein and his hot water colleagues in California this for the California Energy Commission. Um, very thorough report. This is where they discuss the hot water rectangle and these are two of the recent articles I've written on hot water. So that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. Going to dinner now. <laughs> oh, stay. Stay for a minute. We have lots to talk about. Oh, okay. All right. I guess I can stay for a little bit. Thanks, Alice. And that was an excellent presentation. There's a lot in there. There's a lot of questions as a result of all the things that were in there. Uh, and a lot of fun commentary. The chat was blowing up the whole time. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> Right off the top, uh, well, <laughs> Greg, our friend Greg from Australia, he asked about uh, point of use water heaters a little bit. And I, I was curious, uh, you didn't spend a ton of time on that. I was just curious if you would uh, 
comment on that, on those, that equipment? Yeah, so a point of use water heater um, is usually electric. It's a small water heater that's just for, you know, um, like a, uh, I, I worked at South Face a long time ago and, and they built a, uh, onto their original building, they added on the eco office and they had a small kitchen in there. It just had a sink and a dishwasher. And they had a little point of use electric water heater, um, a little electric tankless water heater in there. Um, because running hot water from where the, the main water heater was, and that was the only hot water in that building. And getting hot water from the other building would have been ridiculous for just that little bit of use they had over there. So in some cases, it does make sense to put a, uh, an electric tankless point of use water heater. Electric tankless for whole house makes absolutely no sense. And even though uh, utilities will sell a lot more electricity, if you use one, they don't want to sell you that electricity because the, uh, the power hit is, is too great. And the, the power draw is, um, is really high for electric tankless whole house water heater because it takes a lot of current zapping that water you know, very quickly to uh, heat water for a whole house. Would you, you still at, go ahead, Ben? Sorry, you start looking at some of those on demand uh, electrics for whole house applications. I just did it out of curiosity a number of years ago, and some of them are 200 plus amps. So you're essentially dedicating an entire electrical service in a building to just operating the hot water heater. Is that the same too? Like when you travel a lot in Europe, you see they always have them for like their showers. There's just like one hanging next to the shower. I mean, is, is that even something that should be considered? here or is it basically the same thing is just takes too much energy demand no no the point of use is is okay in some situations i mean if, if you have one shower on the other side of the house and everything else on on you know on, um, on the main side of the house on one side of the house the, the you know a small point of use water heater just for the shower can make sense because you know um running a recirculating pump demand i mean you could do it with a demand recirculating pump but it uh it it may be a wash with putting in a, a point of use water heater for that that remote bathroom i feel like the only yeah. application i've uh, of electric tankless that i've seen requested is when the house is going to be almost exclusively solar supplied with backup and so they're doing it like well hey it's free it's free electricity. Why wouldn't I make everything as electric as possible? So of course, even though it's wildly inefficient, if you're paying nothing for it, then in there. But in that perhaps, case, you should do a heat pump, hot water heater or something like that. If you're trying to make the most efficient use of your generated electricity. Or even a, a regular storage electric resistance water heater. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes more sense. The, the problem with heat pump is the making the cold in the space like stealing is, the heat from your furnace to make heat in your water is that just logically that hurts me. It, it's totally valid too, Travis. Uh, Allison, you mentioned it in your presentation about, you know, in Maine, that might not be the best situation in the winter. And we've actually had uh, clients when I was working with Dan Colbert um, where they shut off the heat pump function because it was in a centrally located portion of the house. The house was very well insulated and airtight and it was actually cooling the house too much for their liking. So they would shut it off during the winter months because it was too much cooling. Yep. Yep. Heat pump if, water. If you can put it in your basement or something like that, like I have one in my basement, which is partially connected to outside. So it has no effect on the house. And yeah, it does great down there. Oh, could we yeah. also get them to all put it so that you don't have to go back like every three days or something to turn it back to all electric in the wintertime conditions when you have that, because that feature seems to be on a lot of them and it's kind of annoying. Because then people don't remember and then they have a, the same issue. It's cold over again. Um, Allison, before I ask you to stop screen sharing, um, somebody did want to see your chart again. Um, and I think it was the chart where you had uh, your usage. Like the second slide. Yeah, the like the second. I, don't, I tried to scroll back through. So in the chat, correct me if I'm wrong, if that's not what you wanted to see. Uh, <laughs> was it this one? I don't remember if it was that I one. It was I your, use. your water usage your consumption. consumption chart. Oh, okay. My mistake. 
with your peak in September for draining the tank. Oh, for the heat pump water heater. Yes, oh, okay. I believe that was it. Yeah, uh, yeah, right here. This one. This one. Yes. Okay. So hopefully whoever put that in the chat box, because that was about 5,000 messages ago. Uh, <laughs> this is what you want to grab a screenshot. Uh, and then. Um, Surprising that it consumes that much energy to recharge the tank after draining. That was kind of a. Shocking. For me. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> is it, you know, what's your water temp, what's your cold water temperature? Like how much energy did it need to come back up from? Like, do you have warm cold water? Uh, yeah, have, it's, cold, well, cold in September, water. I mean, you can see June, June, July, and August, how low those were. Yeah, the incoming water temperature um, matters a lot. And I, I didn't point that out. But yeah, that's with um, with any water heater, the, the amount of energy you use depends on the time of year because the incoming water temperature varies throughout the year. In wintertime, you're going to use more energy, no matter what kind of water heater you have, because you're heating colder water. You've got a bigger delta T. And in the summertime, as the water comes in warmer, the... Um, the amount of energy you have to put into it is a lot less. Uh, or, or in my case, where my heat pump hot water heater is partially connected to outside, it's kind of outside of my thermal envelope. In the winter, it's you know trying to extract heat from much colder ambient air temperatures in my basement than in August when it's much warmer in there. So yep. you, you yeah, my there. basement's currently 46 degrees where the heat pump hot water tank is. It's a little oh. chilly, but it also <laughs> needs some insulation. So working on that. I'm getting a lot of texts from the local prison in Columbia, Missouri, asking about sand and water heaters. I don't know if you have any input uh, <laughs> regarding the, uh, the heat pump water heater. I guess because the unit's outside, you don't have the, the cold dumping into the interior of the space. Yeah. The, um, so the split system heat pump water heater is a great solution for cold climates because just like with a, a heat pump for space heating, you're, you're getting heat from the outdoor air, not from inside the house. So you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're you're getting it from outdoors. So you're making the outdoors colder, <laughs> and um, getting that heat into the house. So it, I mean, it, it's it, it's a good way to go in cold climates if you don't want to use your space heating to um, keep the uh, the air warm enough for the heat pump water heater. They are pricey though. They are significantly more than the uh, regular heat pump water heater. I wonder sure about the durability of some of these higher end systems too. I, that's the pushback I always get when I request from my uh, plumbing subcontractor or my HVAC subcontractor, depending on what we're talking about. There's always this massive pushback, like, "Ooh, you know, we can do that," but gosh, it's, you know, we're probably looking at a you know seven to ten year life and the maintenance on them. God, you know, there's this long hemming and hawing, and I think it's just because they're unfamiliar. Um, and there was a, there's a rough history with heat pump hot water heaters because Allison, you could probably elaborate on this. I only know a little bit about it, but there was an initiative back in the 80s or maybe early 90s with some of the first generation heat pump hot water heaters where they were heavily subsidized, subsidized and put out into the marketplace and they didn't perform nearly as well as they needed to. Um, so there was, you know, some some backlash from that. I'm scrolling through questions here, but Mike is always so fantastic about queuing them up. There wasn't a bold one, so I had to actually think for myself. The bold is key for me, Mike. You know, what? I'm not that sharp. There's no thinking here tonight. Um, Allison, you can keep screen sharing if you want, or you can turn your screen share off. Okay. Um, either way. Uh, let's see. Where do I do this? Um, stop share. There we go. Oh, now we can see you in your bathtub. <laughs> yeah. Overdressed <laughs> for the tub, my friend. Yeah. Oh, I, if, yeah. I, I did want to make a joke about that. I saw Lloyd already put it in the, uh, the comments. But when I had the picture of the shower up, I was going to say something about how um, naked people need building science, not only when you're jumping on the bed in the morning with just your socks on, but, you know, when you go take a shower. Um, so it's building enclosure and mechanical systems and hot water. Classic Lots energy vanguard. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, Mike. So here's here's one. Yeah, is PEX or copper better? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between the baseball? ubiquitous? Yeah, What's... you're not going to give the ubiquitous. It depends. Uh, well, he has to drink, and it's just water. Just water. It's sad tonight. <laughs> Boring. Boring. Yeah, I mean, 
course it depends. I mean, um, in my house, I, I've, I've got copper. Copper is, is fine. Uh, copper, you, know, you got to be careful sometimes. Um, you, you know, with some types of water, you can get pinholes in it and, and get leaks that way. Um, I, I think PEX is the way everything is going, probably. And I see the builder nodding his head. Yeah, the freeze thaw expansion is a pretty big asset for people that are going to do things wrong. Uh, you, you like to protect against those epic failures. And then obviously the speed of install and the cost, kind of a big deal with copper up 300%. I'm the electrician, Joe's the plumber. Uh, so we both are screwed on copper. Yep. 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 Curiously, this morning so, I priced some, some four inch copper and it's a, a $12 an inch, $12 and 40 cents an inch. An inch? So Holy an inch. moly. It's like $140 a foot or something like that for four inch copper. And they only sell it in 20 foot increments. So if you needed yeah. that inch, go ahead. And <laughs> You're free to co-sign, aren't you, Travis? <laughs> wow. I didn't realize it was so high right now. Um, but speaking of, of PEX, uh, you know, fittings are really important. And you want fittings that, um, that go on the outside of the pipe. Uh, you don't want to take away the diameter on the inside. So this is a good kind of fitting right here. How do you feel about um, upsizing the piping for um, fittings that are inside of the pipe? So there's, you know, there's the two types of pecs. There's uh, the crimp connections and the expansion connections. So uh, plumbers I've worked with in the past that use the crimp connections where you're reducing the flow because of the fitting going inside of the pipe, they would upsize a half inch to a three quarter to accommodate for the loss. Is that a realistic thing? Is that... You go from half inch to three quarter. They didn't go to five eighths. Wow, that's a big difference from half inch to. Nobody stocks quarters. five eighths. I've never seen it. Really? Uh, <laughs> no. Well, never. It does exist. That's cute for a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, it does exist. Quarter inch exists too. I I have a roll of it sitting right behind me over there. That I've seen. Everyone uses that for uh, refrigerator ice maker lines that they want oh, yeah, to that's, have that's serviced true. soon. That's true. Yeah, it's actually um, uh, it's not allowed by code for the the water lines um, for the cold or hot water lines inside the house. Um, you well, um, it's through pr the prescriptive requirements. You could get an engineer to approve it for you, um, but it's, it's not allowed prescriptively. How about a southern physicist with a doctorate? Uh, oh yeah, I'll approve it for you. Yes. <laughs> so show, you know. show me your calculus. signed on the back of a napkin. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we also approve that that uh, somebody posted uh, what about health concerns with pecs, right? So you know, what about what concern? Health concerns with pecs, right? Health now we're now pecs. we're running our really hot water through plastic oh. tubing to get to you know whatever whatever. Um, <laughs> I yeah I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I think there's enough parts per million of floating plastic particulate from all of our ocean water that is in our drinking water now that you don't, you just don't even worry about. It's all plastic anyway. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a cocktail. Yeah. What is it? The PFOAs well, and if, you, and if you don't drain your, your hot water tank and it's got other stuff in it, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Solid. It's so uh, Mike highlighted one for us here. It says, are, are there any guidelines for how big of a room is needed for a heat pump hot water heater? Do you need a certain volume of air in that space for it to be effective? Well, it depends. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, Have some water in it. So why heat pump water heaters can be ducted or non-ducted. If if it's ducted uh, and and you can put it in a tiny little room and just run the ducts somewhere else. So you can pull the air from from the attic and then put the air into the crawl space. So be careful I've never seen one ducted how common is it it's not very common but, okay just um, checking I, I i intend to duct mine at some point I, um a friend of mine in virginia um uh, has uh, a well short piece of duct on his right now because on the intake he put a short piece of duct and then a, a filter grill and he's got a merv 13 filter filtering his intake air for the, the, the nice. heat pump water heater. That's a well cared for heat pump hot water heater. Flow through your MERV yeah, 13 okay, filter okay. so it don't make you breathe. I, 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 I don't, 
don't remember what size he put on there, but it's plenty big and there's almost no pressure drop across it. I can say that I do know from experience that a lot of the manufacturers have specifications right in their manuals of what the size of the free air space is where the heat pump hot water heater is in order for you to be able to use it or they require you have ducting attached to it. So check with the manufacturer. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, going back to the question um, about putting a heat pump water heater in a small room, you can put it in a tiny room, you know, as long as it fits and uh, if it's ducted, but it, um, if it's not ducted, you need to be careful with how small a room you put in because it's just going to get colder and colder and colder in there. Ooh, ooh, I got one. Brian Wiley, our good friend Brian asks, here's a question for all the architects and designers in the crowd. When did we get away from a shared wet wall layout? So like you put it in your presentation, Allison, the small hot water rectangle. Uh, it seems like most older homes in Brian's neighborhood and in mine uh, have that very small line down the middle of the house where all the bathrooms backed up to back in the early days. And that just sort of went away. Why? When? Well, I have a couple of things to say about that. <laughs> Go, Emily. Well, I didn't learn that until I started doing building science stuff and I really started thinking about lengths of hot water distribution and, you know, where things go and some commercial work where you talk about coordination drawings and all of that. So uh, for some reason, they don't, they don't always teach that uh, anywhere, but, you know, we try to group ours together and, and make that triangle. It's, it's part of good design. Uh, but Mike had a great comment in there that sometimes uh, if that's going to throw off the whole rest of your design, as far as efficiency goes, it's not always the top priority. Um, but I want to throw something out there too, to all the plumbers out there, stop putting the water heater really far away. If I group all my stuff together, I want my water heater directly under where all the stuff is grouped. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, that that's that's a bigger challenge that, that we have is I'll group it all together and then you know you show up to the job site and they're like well I just want to you know put it over there I'm like well but it's shown on the plan over here <laughs> there is that uh... so, so you tell you tell Joe if he puts my water heater that far away I'm gonna come looking for him <laughs> I think the problem is that especially in our market I know how you love your basement Emily we have a lot of people who want to finish that space. And what they really want is to come down that nice grand stair into the big open bar. And oddly, the water heating device is rarely the feature of the bar. I think that we need to maybe do a little extra work, uh, maybe put a little kegerator uh, look on the front, serve up that hot water with a pull of the tap. I don't know. It's the air conditioner and like just, you know, they make vehicle wraps, just wrap your water heater. It could look like whatever you want. I mean, giant Coors Light can. That's yeah, very Midwestern camouflage. Yeah. Let, let's <laughs> normalize the beauty of water heaters. This has really gone off the rails. What was the next <laughs> yes, question? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so Doug Horrigan uh, uh, commented it, that he thought that Gary Klein had shown that the fittings don't much matter. Uh, rarely more than a few on a route and code requires oversized piping anyway. Does, does that sound correct to you? Um, what, yeah, what, uh, it, it doesn't matter so much to the house, but it, um, it does matter to the water utility because the, the more pressure drop you have in each house, the more pumping energy they need to get the water through the whole system. So it, it's more of a, a big picture thing than in the house. If you're on municipal water. So yeah. What about us out here in the country that are on wells? Does it matter? Um. If you got a big enough pump on your well, it should be fine. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, the is... um, that calculator that I, I sent the link for, you know, I, I showed the link for is um, it was for plastic pipe, but uh, you know that can help you show what the pressure drops are for different flow rates and pipe sizes and things. Yeah, I know for for FIA certification, um, we have to jump through a lot of hoops about pipe length run diameter pressure drop uh, in order to make sure that we're in our, our required volumes. Um, Carol Stenberg brought up a good one. Uh, so when we were talking about the, the wait time in order to get your hot water to your faucet, uh, she made a comment that would it be, would a secondary small tank close to the faucet provide instant hot water while the hot water from the main tank is traveling? Is that more efficient than a circulating pump? 
Should we break out the slide rule? More gear is always better. Let's get let's get individual point of use water heaters on every faucet in the house. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Only on where you wash your hands. Everywhere else you can. <laughs> I just pulled up this picture behind me of Larry Weingarten. This is this was his water heater collection. These are some very old things you can see back there, and. So these would be some that you could put in that basement where you come down the wall, you know, the stairs and you, you know, there's some, some of those old water heaters are beautiful, beautiful things. And I was going to say, if your friends don't that. appreciate a good looking hot water heater, yeah. you need to find better friends. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's about his fifth time, Travis. Yeah, I know. I know. That's I, the first time you notice. <laughs> no, I'm on, I'm on at least earlier. three. <laughs> no, least we were talking about this before. Yeah, it's all relative. Hot is relative, you know? Well, and as it cools, it does need to be heated again if it's a tanked uh, unit. So I guess oh, it is. Don't be a so pedantic. <laughs> well, so while we're talking about heat loss, then, you know, is there worse heat loss through the jacket of your water heater uh, or through your pipe length and pipe loss? Because uh, someone commented, I think, when you were first sharing it, um, like, where's your insulation on your heating on your heat pipes or your hot water pipes yeah my house doesn't have any well it has a little bit by the water heater now but um you know when i got the basement this year that's all coming out and all the hot water pipes will be insulated fully in fact um well i've got a bunch of it sitting right over there right now in pipe insulation has like anyone seen an insulated uh hot, hot water delivery system in the wild like witnessed it okay. not on one of your own projects but in the wild yeah oh, yeah Okay. It's cold here. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I saw it once in a garage. <laughs> so essentially outdoors uh, is the only place it gets insulated in my market uh, historically. Of course, that's changing. So that's good. Uh, what about Zoe Kaufman? She's been all over the chat, very much enjoying the show. Lots of kudos to you, Allison. And she asks, Legionella, remind me of the number one thing that you can do about this. Just live in a place where there's chlorine. Um, so, again, it, it's uh, it's a problem when it gets aerosolized. So, if you if you got biofilms building up and there's Legionella growing in there, and the biofilm breaks off and comes out of the shower and gets aerosolized, and you if you breathe in enough of it, then you get Legionnaire's disease. But it's mostly a problem with with things that go wrong. I I, I mean I've, I've looked for data about how often this happens with you know just from people taking showers at home and i i couldn't find much of anything on that it seems to be hot tubs and cooling towers and uh, water features you know fountains that you know are coming down splashing and aerosolizing the water and biofilms are getting mm. um, spewed everywhere so that's that's mostly where it is but so if, if you're worried about it in the shower you could put a filter on the shower head you can get a shower head that um, sprays bigger droplets, not a, not a mist. Um, ventilate the bathroom, you know, open the windows, use the, the bath fan, uh, and take shorter showers. That's yes, not the American way. showering altogether. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, that's better than low flow. Just don't shower. It's good. Yeah. We solve oh, yes, this no problem. flow. No flow. Yeah, because there are a bunch of questions about low flow fixtures as well, you know, too. So, you know, in this case, in Legionella, you know, a lot of the super low flow, like 1.25, do kind of do that weird misting thing. Um, but that's also a problem with uh, tankless, like not having so low flow that you don't get hot water. Um, that was so, so is it a case for not using? <laughs> Sorry, Dan case? Colbert got me. <laughs> <laughs> don't shower, with, don't any shower with any legionnaire it's nice <laughs> good advice words to live by <laughs> there goes my weekend <laughs> oh man <laughs> so all right so i've got one for you allison that i'm curious about okay. um, so uh drain waste heat recovery uh yes. what are some of the defining factors about when it makes sense and when it doesn't um, there are a lot of people who know a lot more about that than I do, but it's, so it's, um, you want it on a drain where you're going to have continuous, uh, drain water, hot drain water going through. So a shower is a place where you would use that. And 
it um, so the, you know this copper spiral wraps around the the um, the drain pipe and cold water you know so the water coming to the shower will um, you know go in and and the the cold water goes into this this um, drain water heat recovery device and then it goes back into the cold water pipe some of which then goes back in so some of your cold water comes into the shower which means that as the drain water heat recovery starts working you may need to adjust the shower temperature <laughs> because it's going to get hotter as you're recovering some of that heat and putting it back into the shower so um it, you wouldn't use it on a bathtub because that's not going to help you a whole lot uh you would use it on shower and and you know houses and you'd also you also need some space underneath it and usually these things are vertical i have not seen horizontal ones i guess they make horizontal ones. i've only seen vertical installations of it so um seems like you need a basement to do this um or for a second floor shower could you so, could you run the the cold water supply to the hot water heater through that. Um, That's number six. Or, or, or in, <laughs> I'm throwing them intentionally now. So so that you're so that you're tempering the incoming water to the hot water heater and reducing the load there. So um, I guess you could bypass your having to adjust the the valve at that yeah, the the diagrams and I, you know I don't have one of these in my house. I've seen some installed in houses, um, in uh, mostly in Canada though. I did see there there is one I saw here in the Atlanta area. Um, the the diagrams mostly show the you know the the water coming out of the drain water heat recovery device going into the cold water line that um, or, or into the line that could go either back to the hot water heater. <laughs> I said hot water heater. I can't believe it. <laughs> Do we all have to drink now? He it's said hot contagious. water heater. I ran out of beer. It's your fault, Ben. <laughs> oh, no. Ben's fault. <laughs> I have to get another. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it, it shows it um, so that it can go in either to the, to the shower or to the water heater. Um, I don't have the diagram handy right now, and I didn't put it in the presentation. But the, uh, the Building America Solution Center, I think, is where I found a really good diagram of that they've, they've got lots of images do they do they save enough energy to pay for themselves i guess has always been my question that's a, a very good question uh and you know when I, I posted about this. so on gba when i posted my first hot water article uh i think it was just called hot water is a system and so if you go to that article look in the comments and there was a bunch of discussion about drain water heat recovery because i I just put a paragraph about that at the end of the article. And so that's what most of the discussion was about. <laughs> and th there's some really good uh, um, um, links that put, people put in there. So, so um, and I don't have all the details, but, but go, go to the comments in that article and you'll find some good stuff. One thing that um, I, I um, have been told is uh, by a guy in Canada who actually makes these things, is you know people look at this this bare copper on these uh, um, drain water heat recovery things and say why is that not insulated? And the answer is that you only have water going through there for a short time, and copper has a, a fairly low emissivity, so you're not going to lose much heat through con uh, convection or conduction um, or radiation, and it's only used for a short time. But the insulation on hot water pipes is mainly for you know, you, you put a little bit of hot water through and, and you want to keep the water hot for the next time it, it's used. So and that's not really applicable there. So you don't need insulation on the drain water heat recovery. Unless somebody in the comments and the chat tells me I'm wrong. Do you have a preferred insulation type? What's what's in the role behind you for your your fresh system to be insulated? Is it the black rubber foam stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was it polyethylene, I think? Is that the good stuff? Somebody asked in the in the chat. Is there a good or bad insulation? Um, well, I've I've the actually the picture that I showed in there. Uh, the it was some aluminum photograph. foil around fiberglass, right? It was yeah, it was a, um, a fiberglass wrapped rubber. with some kind of white stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, you can use fiberglass. The, I've got foam. Foam I, I, I seems to go on better. Fiberglass is, is easy to compress. Um, so. 
the what, foam bubble wrap's not going to cut it? No. That's the radiant barrier, Emily. It depends if you're putting your water on the underside of your roof deck. <laughs> I love Why do we only insulate the hot? God. I mean, I don't keep my house at, you know, super chilled temperatures. Why, why is it just the hot? Why not the cold too? Don't I want to keep my hot side hot and the cold side cold, just like that McDonald's burger from the 80s? What was that? Anyone? No? Nothing. You lost me there, buddy. I don't remember it. Ouch. Thank you, Nick Berger. Nick Berger gets it. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mike Baines. I feel better now. <laughs> All right. Anyone used a Sandin Sanco 2 with another brand tank like Marathon? Has anyone heard of this mixing and matching? No, Sacco but you can, add, you can add more Sandin tanks onto their compressors. So we have a, a situation on a house I'm working on right now where in the crawl space, we have low head height. So instead of putting their 85 gallon tall tank in, we're putting in two of the 45 gallons, but you can stack, I think three or four of their tanks for more volume or more quantity onto one of their compressors. So if you have a, a situation which is particularly, uh, you know, high demand for hot water, you can put multiple tanks uh, in series with one another. All right. How about resistance heat backup for split hot water heaters in cold climates during cold spells or regular heat pump water heaters? So Mark Anderson asks again, is there resistance heat backup for split hot water heaters? Go ahead and have a drink in cold climates during cold spells or regular heat pump water heaters. I don't know that uh, the sand and does have the uh, resistance backup heat uh, a regular air source uh, um, package unit heat pump water heaters do have the resistance heat there and they're called hybrid water heaters usually because you can you can run them on resistance heat you can run them on uh, heat pump only which is how i have mindset um, or you can do hybrid where it'll use the resistance heat as they think it needs it and I was going to talk about that earlier. I forgot, just in case anybody wasn't aware that heat pump water heaters do have electric resistance elements in them for that. And, and, and you know, somebody mentioned earlier that uh, uh, in a cold climate, sometimes people just run it on electric resistance in the wintertime to prevent the, the indoors from getting too cold. Yeah, the sand and as far as I know, they perform down to very low temperatures in cold climates, I, I think aside from being in climate zone eight or something like that, uh, you're probably gonna be fine even in the coldest times yeah. of the year, as long as you're not trying to run a bathhouse. Uh, the chat's saying time. negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, pretty And cold. also that only bathhouses are worth salmons. <laughs> are you accusing me of building a bathhouse, Travis? I was just talking about your lifestyle again. You know, the Legionnaires got to enjoy their <laughs> <laughs> their bathhouse. They got to have a real nice place. <laughs> what I do in my free time is my business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm envisioning the French Foreign Legion hat and nothing else. It's very disturbing. Uh, Nightmares. Oh, oh Lord. This, I think this is American Legion. Oh well, that, they don't have a cool hat though, do they? That's, no, uh, no, that's, hotel, the that's the Shriners. Oh, yeah, funny <laughs> that's the <laughs> That's even weirder, buddy. Wow, you're dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's your deal, man. <laughs> oh, what's uh, the latest Scott... on the noise issue with the latest Gen 5 Ream water heaters? Yeah, what is that? I, I have a Gen 4 in my house, and it is really quiet. I mean, it, you know, I'm in the basement. It's right over there. And I don't have a door on my mechanical room right now because the basement's sort of disassembled somewhat. But, um, I, and I hear it a little bit. It's, I mean, it, it's not yeah. even as loud as my dehumidifier is sitting over there. So the Gen 4 is not loud. And I, and I did in the article I wrote on, on the living with the heat pump water heater, I, I did put some noise data from my, uh, from my NIOSH uh, decibel app. But the Gen 5, I don't know. I, I have heard that it's noisier than the Gen 4. So yeah, I heard that recently. It sounds like something just recently is a lot of people complaining about it. 
is Ream your preferred brand for package T pump hot water heaters? Do you have kind of a, a ranking of favorites? Because this seems um, to be an ever moving target for people. Yeah. Well, when I bought mine uh, in 2019, um, I asked John Simmelhack. And uh, at that time, you know, he and the other people who know heat pump water heaters were all over the ream. So I got the ream and, and I'm very happy with it. Um, the ream, I, I want to learn more about the Gen 5. Is it just a noise issue or is there other stuff going on with it? So if anybody has a Gen 5, let's hear it. Or if anybody would like to donate to our GoFundMe so we can purchase one and test it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked a question about adding uh, uh, forced air coils onto sand dunes, and I can say that that is a possibility. We're currently doing that on one of our projects, so um, they used to frown upon that, um, but uh, Sand and Sanco is coming around and is now supporting it to some degree. So we're harvesting about 9,000 BTUs an hour off of a sand and unit and supplying domestic hot water at the same time. There was also Mike had a question. Tankless coils and indirect water heaters are common in older houses in Maine. Are there boilers where that can be an efficient system? Boilers? I don't know anything about boilers. What's a boiler? <laughs> you don't have those in the south. <laughs> What's this boiler? In my basement. It's something that actually does not boil water most of the time. <laughs> most boilers do not boil. I know that. They just heat water. It's a hot water detepidizer. Detepidizer. <laughs> Taking the tepid out of it. <laughs> and then when they do boil things and they make steam, it's not good. Uh, unless you intended to make steam. There unless you intended steam to. steam heating systems. And Dan Holohan is the master of steam heating. And if, if um, heating, heating help is their website. And he, he is an amazing storyteller. Besides, you should all be ripping out your boilers and trading in your copper because it'll pay for whatever else you're going to put in. Yeah, 12 bucks an inch, right? Wow. I don't think you get that in the scrap <laughs> price, but it's still uh, pretty nice. Yeah, that pricing structure is very inverted. You only get that big bump when you purchase it. When you return, there's a significant fall off. Mm -hmm. It's like net metering with solar production. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Um, Michael Rhodes wants to know, is there any thoughts about using heat pump water heaters for space heating? For space heating, um, like with you know, hydronic coil attached to it or something. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, if, I mean, if, if it were a split system, that would make sense. If you're, if you're using it for indoors, it wouldn't make sense. <laughs> because you're taking heat from indoors to supply heat to indoors. It would have to be a split system where you're getting heat from outdoors. Yeah. And can they be run in reverse to chill water? Air to water heat pumps can be run in reverse to chill. So uh, they have, you know, what are they, the, the space packs, the Nordics, uh, all these air to water, you know, Dykin used to have the Althermas. Um, some of those air to water heat pumps, they're not typically meant for domestic though. You can do them with a heat exchanger. You can treat domestic hot water off of them. They can be run in reverse for, uh, for cooling. Like what is it, the Masana systems now, the radiant cooling panels and heating panels. You can use a, a single air to water heat pump that will do both your heating and your cooling throughout the year. Um, but radiant cooling is a whole nother can of worms that I'm too nervous to dive into. Not like those bathhouses. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> lowest common denominator. <laughs> uh, there, <laughs> there was another good question from uh, Hans, uh, upgrading an old non-recirculating system by re recirculating into the cold lines, is that allowed in North America and what are the requirements? I found that interesting too. I'd not seen that. And it seems like, oh, that could work and should and 
is recommended, but is it allowed? Uh, it is allowed. That's what the demand recir recirculation systems mostly do. Um, they run the, uh, you know, they'll bring the hot water to the fixture and then dump it back into the cold water line where it, you know, goes back to the water heater. But um, I have a, a friend who used to, uh, he's a chemist and he worked for the, um, um, the county water authority uh, for decades until he retired. And uh, when I was talking to him about that type of system, he was very concerned about putting wa you know, water from the hot side back into the cold water line because you don't want to drink stuff that was sitting in the, in the water heater uh, because you, you know you get stuff in there, you get sediment in the bottom, you get uh, other things and the biofilms. You know the warm water can can uh, can do things uh, to the life forms out there, and so you generally you don't want to drink out of the the hot line. And by putting it back in there, somebody could be drinking out of the the hot side, and so. But the demand recirculation system, I mean, it's, it's it's a very short run, and and the you know, it's mostly going back to the water heater. So usually not a concern there, but I think it is allowed. I mean, it, it, yeah, it has to be allowed because it's done, right? <laughs> That's never stopped us on a number of other fronts, Alison. <laughs> well, Let's I, not make that assumption. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a whole nother show. <laughs> Things you're allowed to do that maybe you should. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, if that's a <laughs> oh, nice, nice uh, virtual background, Ben. <laughs> I try. I try. It was, it was a shot from last week. So, so uh, Doug brought up anode rods and how they dissolve in hot water. Um, th that seems to be something that a lot of people forget about, and uh, it's mysterious to some. Uh, and, and the results of losing your anode rods. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the importance of that and why we need those? Yeah, so anode rods, um, they're called sacrificial anode rods for a reason. And the, um, the, the tank um, is made out of metal and it's glass lined. And if you, uh, because of the chemistry going on in there, the, um, the lining of the tank can get eaten away and eventually can corrode and, and fall apart. And then all your water comes out and you have a mess. And so they put the sacrificial anode rod. So the uh, ions and the water will attack the, the anode rod and um, instead of the, the tank. So the, uh, that anode rod over time will disappear. And sometimes quickly, sometimes not, it depends on the quality of the water that you have. So, that's something that needs to be checked and replaced. And if you if you are religious about changing the anode rod, your water heater can last for decades, multi, uh, like 20, 30, 40 years. Larry Weingarten told me, you know, 50 years. You just drain the, you know, um, drain the, the tank every once in a while, change the anode rod when it needs it, and your water heater tank can last basically forever. But then you have to have somebody that remembers to check your anode in your hot yeah. water heater. And so, I mean, if you're spending money on a heat pump water heater, that's definitely something that you need to um, to be doing because you don't want your tank to die before your heat pump dies. <laughs> um, because then you're you you've wasted money and you've you've got a stranded asset there. I don't know that you can change out the tank and keep the same heat pump on it. Is that it's a matter? Similar. I was going to say, is that a matter of just checking the anode rod periodically, or is it something where if you had your water tested and knew what was in it, you might be a little bit, uh, you know, prescriptive about like, oh, I'm going to have something in here that's clearly going to be a problem. From what I understand, you actually have to uh, pull it out of the tank and look at it. Um, I, I mean, a water quality test may help you some. I, I haven't heard about that, but uh, you, you have to um, break that nut and get it out of the tank and it's it's a very difficult nut to crack <laughs> because you have to have a really big wrench and sometimes even a cheater pipe on that because it's really torqued on there especially when they first come from the factory they're they're really super torqued on there and the that that's uh, a difficulty with the heat pump water heater is that your tank is is here and your heat pump is sitting on top of the tank and the anode rod you, you know you've got to get down in through the top to get the anode rod, at least in my ream. I don't know, maybe some other ones are different, but usually it goes through the top. 
because it's really long. It's like four feet long. And, uh, and that raises some issues too, because if you're in a room with a low ceiling, <laughs> you may have to saw that anode rod to get it out of the tank and then, and then get- How one do you get the new the, one the, in? Well, they, they, you can get jointed ones. So that uh, they'll, they'll bend going in. I was gonna just drill a hole in my living room floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a real remodeling <laughs> opportunity, Ben. Yeah, yeah, great. Don't give my wife any ideas. <laughs> But that's, a, that's, I guess that that's also kind of a similar phenomenon that with like on demand gas hot water heaters, I've seen a number of failures with the heat exchanger coils because of water quality issues. And I don't know that there's any great way to prevent that. You know, there's the recirculation flushes of those units annually, but that seems to get missed. And sometimes there's just locations where the water quality doesn't work with them. I, I speak from experience. My mom's house, she had a hot water heater, an on-demand gas hot water heat exchanger coil uh, go after six months because of the water quality there. So, yep. so. yeah, yeah, you know, maintenance, it's all about maintenance. I mean, it, everything, everything about a house, <laughs> it's maintenance. You got to maintain Like it. water heater isn't no maintenance? It, Who would have known? There's no such thing as a no maintenance water heater. Well, on that note, maintenance-free doesn't exist. Uh, Ben's headed to the bathhouse, so I'm going to enroll in the French Foreign Legion, and Allison is no longer in the hot tub. I'd say we pretty well covered our bases here. Yeah. Uh, have another water, Emily, and we'll <laughs> catch up with everyone next week. Allison, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much. All righty. Bye-bye. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, guys. I know. Good night.